Hello. Um, thank you so much for having me here tonight. Um, just so you know, if you sit next to lunch, next to Liz at lunch, you will get asked back to do this. But um, I'm really honored to be here. Um, it's always really fun to come back to the apartment and kind of at the beginning of the year, meet all new people and see a lot of familiar faces. So thank you um, for having me here. I actually um, was telling Liz earlier that this is a talk that I, I cobbled together um, actually from a talk that I gave at SVA my first semester here. Um, so when people tell you that uh, the work you do here you will use in years to come, it is true. Um, so some of you will see things that are familiar to you. Um, for first years who are here, you'll see kind of a taste of some things to come. Um, but I think what I really want to communicate to you guys tonight is um, I want to talk about why design is really meaningful to me. Um, I want to talk about some of the things that I've learned um, since I've graduated and some of the things that I've learned um, since my first semester here. I know you guys are just starting class yesterday, today, yesterday, two days ago, something like that. Um, and so uh, that's kind of what I want to talk about. But um, here's what I know for sure, um, is that as designers, we live in a constant tension. And we live in a tension between two things. And the first thing is that, as we all know, design is a lot of hard work. It's really hard. Um, it's complex. It's messy. It's sometimes not always clear. Um, but the other thing I know is that design is also really powerful. And it's powerful because it affects people's lives. And it affects how people experience the world. And it, ex it affects. Um, how people interpret their environments. And I've never heard anyone say this ever. I've never heard anyone say, the thing that I love most about the internet is that it is a lot of hard work. Because what I mean when I say design is hard is I mean that it's hard for us as designers. Um, people don't love that the internet is hard to use or hard to understand or technically challenging. They love how the internet makes them feel. And they love how the products that we build and we design make them feel about their world. Because for them, these digital surfaces aren't just a thing, right? They're not, um, for them, they're not code. You know, they're not um, servers and wires and pixels and animations. Um, they're not glass and plastic. Um, for them, it is an experience. Um, and it is a shared experience with the people around them in their environments. And the surfaces that they hold carry and contain many of their interactions. They contain their relationships, their goals, their achievements, their personal histories. And what we design is really powerful because it brings people into connection with each other. And so I think, for me, the reason that design becomes really powerful is it has the ability to lift people off the glass surfaces of their phones um, and really propel them into an experience that they wouldn't be able to have any other way. Um, and I, I love working at Twitter. The reason I went to go work at Twitter is because I feel like it's, it's one of the only products out there that really um, enables these shared experiences and connected experiences with groups of people. Um, because just like a lot of the other products that are out there, people don't come to Twitter because it's hard. They don't you know, knock on our door in the morning and say, I love Twitter because it's so hard to use. <laughs> they don't. Um, people come back to Twitter because they find that it brings them into a community. They find that it gives them a voice. And what people love about Twitter is that it lets them feel like they can be part of something bigger than themselves. And so these are just some of the things that tell me that design can be really powerful despite the amount of work we have to put into it. But I think we have a problem. I think that design is really hard because it's based on this technical foundation of code. And this code is predictable, it's precise, it's measurable, it's repeatable, it's scalable. And these are all of the things that make an experience work, right? This is what makes our job hard, is because we have to take all of this and figure out how it works. But design is powerful because when you put it into the hands of people, it becomes relevant and meaningful and powerful and connected. 
And this is how an experience feels. And what's hard for us is that as designers, we sit smack in the middle of those two things. It is our job to take all of the technical complexity of our engineer's code and turn it into something really beautiful and delightful and connected for our users. And so the question that I've been asking myself over and over and over and over since I've graduated is this. How do we as designers actually bridge the gap between how an experience works and how an experience feels? Because oftentimes what I see is that we as designers underestimate the complexity of the processes that are required to execute on that experience. Um, so what I want to talk about tonight is how I understand that complexity um, and how I approach that complexity in my own process, um, how I've kind of learned about that. Um, and this is actually um, started for me not through product design and not through um, technology at all, but through athletics. Um, before I was a product designer, I was an athlete and I was a coach. I started rowing when I was 14 years old. Um, and I was immediately addicted. Um, there are few things on this earth that make me feel more alive than when I am on the water. Um, when you're in a boat, I can't, can't describe it to you, but the boat becomes an entity of itself. Um, it has life, it has breath, and it has a spirit all of its own. And when I was sitting in that boat, I could tell that it was an experience that was bigger than me. It was because I was part of this interconnected fabric and a harmony of a team that, of people that were just working in complete abandonment towards a common goal. And at 14 years old, I think I was maybe 15 in this photo, it was the first thing that I did that made me feel really alive. It was something that I felt <coughs> viscerally, like in the core of my being. Um, and that feeling of the boat, we actually call it the boat feel, um, and that team and the teams that I was on subsequent to that, um, that feeling was a personal experience for me that was really meaningful. And it was really connected and it was really, really powerful. Because for rowers, the boat is never just a thing. You know, a lot of people kind of look at our racing boats and they're like, oh, it's just a boat. And you want to kind of shake them and say, no, it's not just a boat. It's an experience that I live with every day. Um, and it's an experience that you can never quite get your arms around. Um, and even though it's kind of this thing that you can't really describe, it is a sport that is insanely technical. Um, the boat is powered by a methodical, calculated, mechanical stroke that operates like a well-lubricated machine. And to get that right, it is a ton of hard work. I started coaching nationally competitive crews when I was 21 years old. Um, and I didn't start coaching because I was particularly interested in winning. I didn't care really about more medals on my wall or more trophies in my parents' basement. Um, I, I really didn't care about winning. Um, I loved coaching and why I started coaching was because I wanted others to have the chance to feel what I felt. And I wanted my athletes to be a part of that fabric and to feel what it was like to be on a team and to bring them into a shared experience with each other, into a shared connection with the water um, and with their environment. But in order to do that, I had to figure out how to bridge this gap. Because in rowing, how the boat feels, that boat feel that we talk about, is directly and inextricably tied to how it technically works. Um, and so I want to talk about the hours and hours and hours that I spent on the water and how that's affected the way I think about designing digital experiences at Twitter and otherwise. Um, because I really think rowing and coaching give me better ways to answer this question. And I think this has really great implications for our work as designers and I really actually hope you'll bear with me because um, I know that most of you CrossFitters out there think of something like this when you think about rowing, which is really breaking my heart. Um, because unlike the ergs, 
Um, rowing on the water means rowing in a really shifting, dynamic, and often unstable environment filled with thousands of moving pieces. The erg has one moving piece, maybe two moving pieces if you count the human on it. Um, but rowing on the water is an environment that you can't always control because it's affected by people's interactions with it. And for us, this is what that environment looks like. This is an eight-person rowing shell. Um, most people just call it a boat. Um, and just to give you guys some context, boats are longer than tractor trailers. Um, they measure about 65 feet long. They're about 20 inches wide. Um, and they're usually no more than a quarter of an inch thick. They're made out of uh, honeycomb and carbon fiber. And they usually weigh about 200 pounds. They're directed down a one to three mile race course um, by sheer human force, willpower, and a rudder that's no bigger than the size of a credit card. Oars, or blades, as we call them, extend 12 to 13 feet past the edge of the hull on either side of the boat. There are four blades on starboard and four blades on port if you're in an eight-man shell. And each piece of that equipment can be um, configured or rigged to maximize and amplify the strengths of whatever particular crew that you are coaching. And some of these adjustments are very small. They in involve things like pins and collars and sleeves and things. Um, and other adjustments are quite large and require a complete refactoring of the mechanics of your stroke. Um, the physics of this equipment and the weight distribution of the athletes down the hull of the 65-foot boat means that a two-inch variance in a single rower's hand height will affect the balance of the entire boat. Yet, despite this very small margin of physical error, it is a sport that draws on the time coordination of every major muscle group in the human body and most minor ones. And just as you can optimize for each part of that equipment, you can also optimize for each part of the stroke, making certain muscle groups more efficient at just the right time and at just the right place to optimize for speed or optimize for power. And the tricky part becomes when it's, you realize it's not just the muscle groups of your own body that has to make this happen, but everybody's body's working in perfect synchronicity, and it's that time coordination that gets that 20-inch wide tractor trailer down the race course. And with it, it has to carry almost one ton of human flesh, bone, muscle. Um, without a doubt, this complexity makes rowing a lot of hard work. It's physically demanding, it's mentally taxing, it's technically challenging. Um, and I don't know if you guys have, have read this book called Boys in the Boat, it's been around a little bit. Um, it's awesome and I love Daniel James Brown's analogies of rowing, I, I can't like make them up better myself. Um, but what he says about the physical um, kind of complexity of rowing is, he says that pound for pound, an Olympic oarsman or oarswoman has to process as much oxygen as a thoroughbred racehorse. And what this means at this level, an athlete must be able to consume as much as eight liters of oxygen a minute. Now, that sounds like a lot until you realize that the average male can only process four to five liters at most which leaves us with about half the amount of oxygen that we need every stroke. And the result of that is a lot of pain. Um, when you're a human operating at racehorse levels, you have to process a ton of lactic acid and the physical toll is really undeniable. Um, common rowing injuries, slip discs, fractured ribs, blisters, tendonitis, vomiting and passing out is not an uncommon thing. Um, in races or practice. Yet, somehow, you have to find a way to execute flawlessly in spite of this pain. Because what I will tell you next is that the physical demands of the sport are only half the story. It's only half of it. Because the true test of a crew's work and a true test of the crew's effort is actually in their ability to technically master the sequence of highly complex movement under these extreme physical conditions. They have to make it calculated, and they have to make it repeatable. And it's not just about executing one time, one stroke, whenever you feel like it, um, 
but it's about repeating this movement over and over and over at various rhythms and speeds with seven other people who are feeling equally exhausted. You do it all facing backwards. You don't have any physical connection or verbal communication with anybody else in the boat. And one missed stroke has drastic implications on your forward movement down that race course. And um, I'll kind of draw again on Daniel James Brown because he just explains it so horribly and so beautifully. Um, he says that the, um, the physical effort and the technical effort, he says, is maddeningly difficult. It's as if eight men standing on a floating log that threatened to roll over whenever they moved had to hit eight golf balls at exactly the same moment with exactly the same amount of force, directing the ball to exactly the same point on the green, and doing so over and over and over every two to three seconds. The object of their endeavor is, of course, to make the boat move through the water as quickly as possible. But the faster the boat goes, the harder it is to row well. The enormously complicated sequence of movement, each of which an oarsman must execute with exquisite precision, becomes exponentially more difficult to perform as the stroke rate increases. As the tempo accelerates, the penalty of a miscue, or an oar touching the water at the wrong time, becomes ever more severe, the opportunity for disaster ever greater. At the same time, the exertion required to maintain a high rate makes all the physical pain all the more devastating and therefore the likelihood of a miscue greater. Rowing is a lot of hard work. However, if you ask any rower ever what they love about the sport, if you sit them down and say, why do you do such a thing? They will sit across from you with sparkly tears in their eye and tell you that what they love about sitting in that boat and propelling it through the water is not how it works or the amount of work that it requires, but how it feels. Crew is partly about confidence and partly about knowing your own heart. Because in those critical moments on the race course, when you are feeling nothing but excruciating pain, what you love and what keeps you coming back for more and more and more, what sustains you is not the effort you have to put into it, but the trust that you have in those seven other people to catch the water at exactly the same time, interact with the surface and create the conditions that none of you could have created by yourself. In rowing, the boat is not a thing. It is an experience. It's a feeling. And we actually have a name for this feeling, and I am not lying. We call it connection. When a boat is connected, we say that they have found their swing. And swing means, uh, when a boat finds their swing, it means that the work of taking a stroke has become so effortless that it actually completely transforms this physically demanding and hellish experience into something incredibly delightful and really quite sublime. Swing is not a conjured state induced by lack of oxygen to the brain. Um, I can attest to that. But in rowing, again, the, how a boat feels and the ability to find that swing is directly linked to how it technically works. So let me give you a little bit of a rowing lesson. Small. Swing is achieved when all 16 arms and all 16 legs and all eight backs and all 80 toes and 80 fingers prepare and move at precisely the same time and the same rate and put the blade in the water at exactly the same time, crisply and intentionally and methodically. And what happens is the blades go in the water, as you can kind of see here, um, and they connect with such unison um, and they connect at the same rate, the same speed, the same power application, that instead of pushing that boat through the water, the crew is actually able to use the leverage of the oars to pick the boat up out of the water and propel it across the surface. When crews find their swing, the stroke feels like clockwork. It's when the effort feels effortless. Um, and what was once a 2,000 pound tractor trailer becomes really graceful and transformative and connection, connected. 
And we say that when connection feels good, the work is easy. And so yes, rowing is a lot of work, and rowing is really powerful, but we know that it's powerful because we have that feeling of the swing. It's when all the technical pieces come together and we feel something bigger than ourselves. And the water that we push against becomes a surface that sustains all of our interactions with it. It sustains all of our relationships with everybody else in the boat. It sustains our goals and achievements of the entire crew. There is a man, his name is George Yeoman Pocock. He is a grandfather of rowing. And he writes about it this way. He says, when you get the rhythm of an eight, it's pure pleasure to be in it. It's not hard work when the rhythm comes, that swing, as they call it. I've heard men shriek out with delight when the swing comes in an eight. It's a thing that they will never forget as long as they live. When connection feels good, the work is easy, and it is meaningful and memorable and addictive. Rowing is much more than a feeling. But the practice of rowing, like the practice of design, requires work. You have to know why it feels that way and how to make it feel that way again. And so, like product designers, the success of any coach is their ability to transform a series of highly technical processes into a connected experience for a group of people. As coaches and designers, we have to create those conditions where people feel something meaningful that they can't get their arms around, that they want to come back to. We have to show people the transformative power that exists in a complex technical environment. And we can't just assume that people who don't know how to row or people that don't know how to sign up or use our products or click a button will wake up one day and just figure it out. It's not going to happen. They're not going to find that connection on their own. They can't sit in a boat and figure out how to move it. They can't open up our apps and figure out how to use them. And I think this is where our problems come in because we often underestimate the complexity of behaviors we are designing for. We underestimate the amount of effort required to develop the smallest interactions between a user and her environment. It's really hard. Getting someone to change their hand height by two inches is really hard. Getting someone to download your app, tweet for the first time, or trust your service, put their credit card information into a form that they don't know where it's going is really hard work. And we don't have really good ways of expressing that complexity. I like sit in um, crits at different schools and companies and even sometimes at Twitter and, and people, and you say, well, why, why is that so hard? Or why is it that, why did you design it that way? And people say, well, you know, it just kind of feels good. <laughs> no, I don't know, it just doesn't feel right. Bullshit. Bullshit, design is more than a feeling. And we need to start taking it seriously. Because right now, the way that we talk about design is very linear. We have a series of inputs, and we have a series of outputs. And we think it's this very simple linear process. If I build it this way, people will click it. If I put a button, people will press it. If I lean out this side of the boat, it will fall over. Um, if I complete the steps, it will be successful. But we can't confine something as complex as product design, or rowing for that matter, into a simple linear system. And so we actually need more complex models to do this. One that factors in for behaviors and context and motivations and actions and our hardware limitations, our code constraints. We need a model that can accommodate all the moving parts of our experience. And it's not just based on inputs and outputs, but it's based on four things. And this is where things might start to get familiar for you SVA folks. Um, but it's based on having a goal, having actions in a particular environment, and getting feedback. Does it look familiar to anybody? Yes? <laughs> Good. Um, this will come in very handy for you guys. I use this all the time. But for those of you who haven't seen this, let me just explain. This is what a, a complex system looks like, at least part of it. Um, and complex systems have goals. They have something they want to achieve. And they ask why, not just what. Why should we do this? Um, and we can evaluate our actions and adjust our tools to achieve that goal by using the system. So again, really quickly, if anybody needs a refresher, a goal is set. 
there is something or someone that evaluates that goal, and action is taken in a particular environment, and there are usually things in that environment that we can't control. Um, and then you look to see what effect that had on the environment, and you say, did I achieve my goal, yes or no? And then you try it all again. Um, and I could bore you for hours, which I did to a, a group of my classmates, um, about how rowing applies to this system up to like three orders of magnitude. I won't do that. Um, it's way more interesting for me than it is for you, but I will start to kind of use this process to relate how what we do as designers can start to bridge this gap. Um, and so I'll just walk you through a really quick example. I'm sure it's an example most of you have seen most of the time, but I think what, when we think about building products, um, this is a really simple example, but we think about, okay, what, what are people's goals on the internet? What are people's goals in our product? And commonly it's, hey, I wanna see some good stuff. Show me some good stuff. Um, and so one of the things they might do is they might browse around, and they usually do that in a place called home. It could be the home timeline, it could be your home newsfeed, it could be your home page. Um, and there's some things in that environment that don't work out so well. Uh, maybe we've put too much content there, or maybe you actually don't have the right social graph to find the good content that you need, um, or just your organization of your website sucks, and you can't find anything. These are all common designer problems. Then we measure it and we say, um, how do I feel about this? Is this good? Yes or no? Um, and, and that's kind of just how it keeps going. But how does this affect us? Because this is about people. Right? Like this is about what people experience. How does this affect us as designers? Because this isn't about pixels or animations or you know, how, do, how do we determine what we do. Um, and again, that's where we have to decide what actions are we enabling to achieve those goals? What actions am I enabling in that boat to get them to pick it up off the water instead of push it through? Is there a good environment for those actions to take place? Maybe it's windy that day. Maybe there's a lot of waves. Maybe the boat broke. Maybe we don't have a rudder. Um, and then how do people interpret what we build in the environments that they're in? And then um, how do, how, what do we do with that? And we have to understand all of these pieces before we can get anything to work. And I will tell you right now that outside of these walls, people don't do that very much. And so this is a pretty big deal to sit and look at all the pieces and say, there's this piece and this piece and this piece and this piece, and this is how they work together. Um, and this is how that looks, right? Learning systems, everyone. For those of you that aren't familiar, this is the system that actually influences the first and has the ability to change the goals. And that system has all of the same components as the first system, but it just ensures that the first system is doing its job correctly. And I think what's important to remember and what I've learned kind of outside of, of the program here is that each intersection on this map is a place for things to fall apart. And it's a place for things to have some problems. But it's also those places where you can amplify your whole experience, lift it up, and move it along. Um, and so it's really, really important to understand all of those points. Um, so again, I'll oversimplify here, but just for kind of point of, of argument, say this is you, and you being a student here, you being a designer at Twitter, you being a company, you being a head of your department somewhere. Um, but I'm going to guess the system that you kind of work in looks like this. And so we say, how do we get someone to achieve their goal of seeing good content? I know, we'll show more content. And so we do. And then we say, what can we do? Oh, no, I know. I'll send an email. Because we think, hey, this will help you see more content. It'll help us show more content. And then you kind of go through the whole thing. OK, you're seeing good content. You're, bra you're like clicking on the email. You're browsing the website. You're going home. And you're saying it's good. And then we say, great. Um, and a lot of times, the way that people measure this is eyeballs. How many people came back to look at our stuff? right? Um, and we think that's great, and everything's working really well. And we understand all the pieces, and we know where everything is, and we know where everything fits, and it looks great. Um, but what we really need to be asking is, how do we make this better? We have this system. This system exists everywhere. This is not an uncommon system. This is a super simple system. Um, 
but how do we use these pieces to actually make a user feel something, right? Because this is still pretty technical. Like I can't walk up to somebody with, I can't walk up to my mom and be like, hey mom, this is your experience. She'll be like, what the hell is that? Um, so how do you make the system better? I'm sure you see ways. First problem, we have a conflict between our goals, right? It doesn't matter how much content you show because the user's goal is to see good content. And so we try to solve this in different ways. Right? We say, okay, we'll show more relevant content. We'll show only content that your friends have favorited 90 times or that people have liked the most or um, you know, that's gotten the most comments on it. And that is our measure of what good is, and we can do that. Which is awesome until that system breaks and we show that content too frequently or we don't show it at the right times or we show it to the wrong people. Right? And so the other kind of complexity in this kind of goal setting framework is this works if this is everyone's goal. But when you get into a big company like Twitter or Apple or Facebook or even small companies, um, everybody's goals aren't the same, right? Even between designers. My goal as a designer on kind of the mainstream consumer product team is very different than the goals of designers who are building ads and revenue based products. Their goal is to make money. My goal is to like, show people good stuff. Like, those are two really different goals. And so how do you, how do you then reconcile those? Um, and so I think once I kind of put this in, into the real world, things got really complicated. Things got really complex. Um, lots of moving pieces, right? Here's some, here's some others. Why is this the best action? Like, why is this the best thing we can do? You will sit in meeting rooms for hours and discuss that. Promise you. Um, and so you have to know. You have to know. Why is sending an email the best thing? Because there will be 20 people looking across from you at the table going, I know, guys, we can send an email. Um, so what we have to ask ourselves is, how do our choices as designers affect someone's ability to connect with their environment? Here's another. Um, eyeballs are obvious ways to measure goals, but do they actually matter, right? Because if you look, eyeballs are things, right? And the way that people are measuring their experience is by how it feels. We, we have some problems, right? And so other conversations that I've had is, is how do we quantify the squishy things, right? Like we can't quantify how people feel. So we'll just resort to eyeballs because we can count those. One, two, three, four, five, right? We can, we can count the eyeballs, but we can't necessarily quantify how people feel. So how are you designing your products so they can be measured and interpreted in ways that people understand and that people can measure? Maybe it's the amount of time they spend or the kinds of engagement they're taking on a certain piece of content or their satisfaction with the experience. There's lots, lots of ways to do that. One more example, last example. Um, there's a problem here, right? Because your goal of showing more stuff is actually not helping you solve the problem. If your problem is that you have too much content, your goal should not be to show more. I know this seems like a really simple, basic concept, but like, people don't get it. Um, and so, I think it's, it's being able to recognize and understand how these complexities and how all of these moving pieces work together so that you can communicate to people on your teams and say, hey, engineer, this is why it doesn't work. Hey, product manager, let's think about this. It helps you find the vulnerabilities in your system much faster. It helps you identify the places where these systems are malleable to say, oh, actually, you know what? Like, if you put your hand height up this high and you put your hand height down this low, you're actually balanced out. Great. Um, so you find these kind of squishy parts that you can start to move around. And I think what, what I've learned and what I've taken away from this experience at SVA and what I've taken into my job at Twitter and what I used without even knowing it as a coach um, is that design is powerful because we can actually affect the environments um, that people live in every day. And it's powerful because we can actually, as product designers, design interactions and sequences of movements where eight or eight million or 800,000 or 800 million people can all stand on that log and hit the golf ball at the exact same time 
within a shifting and disruptive environment. And when we do that work, when we put in the really hard work of figuring that things, those things out, people feel something. And so we, we can't keep thinking in these linear systems. We can't just keep thinking that if we do one thing, something else will happen. Because if we do one thing, 90 things will happen. And if we do one thing, you know, the person that's sitting in the back of the boat might do something differently than the person sitting in the front of the boat. And how do you communicate that? So that's step number one. Step number two is we have to understand all of the pieces. We have to understand the goals. We have to understand the actions, the environments, and the feedback of our digital products. And finally, we have to acknowledge that the interfaces we design are actually an interconnected fabric that's made up of thousands and thousands of pieces that really come together in powerful ways. I mentioned George Yeoman Pocock earlier. He, um, he was a designer. He designed and built boats. Um, probably one of the greatest boat builders that ever lived. Um, but I think what is really inspiring to me about George Pocock is that he designed things. He designed things that people could touch and interact with, and still today, Pococks are um, one of the most highly respected boats in our sport. Um, and he said, rowing is a great art. It is the finest art there is. It is a symphony of motion. And he created those things so that crews could be and feel successful. And I think as designers, we actually have a lot to learn from him. Because what Pocock realizes, he realized that the greatness of our sport was not in the object that he made. The greatness of the sport was the way that a person interacted with that object in a changing environment. And as a master boat builder, he knew to his core that he was not making a thing. He was crafting an entire experience. He was crafting an experience that carried the resilience, the pain, the spirit, the connection, and the hard work of any crew that sat in it. And if, if successful, he knew that when people used the thing that he made, their actions could actually transcend the object itself. And their actions could lift and propel them into shared experiences. Pocock, I think, more than any other designer I know, designed for the feeling. And so I'd like to propose something. I'd like to propose that designing for user experience is a great art, and it is a symphony of motion. The fact that people can hold and touch and interact with the things we make in all of their technical and behavioral complexity at the same time um, experience this power and connection and community is, I think, nothing short of miraculous sometimes. But um, design is not miraculous. It is a lot of hard work. And the power generated by our technology, just like the power generated by the crews that I was a part of and the crews that I coach and the crews that you see in the Olympics, um, that power is incredibly intentional and coordinated. And we need to recognize the part that we play as designers to create those interfaces where people can feel something, where they can feel proud when they reach a goal, or they can feel confident um, when they sign up for the first time, or they can feel connected when they meet somebody new. And so like Pocock, we have to remember that the products we design are actually environments that hold great possibility for action, for delight, for disruption, and for change. And it's the people using that object who ultimately control how it works and so we need to equip them with the proper actions and the proper environments and the proper um, tools to execute gracefully. So thank you so much for having me here tonight. I really love talking about this. Um, but um, thanks for having me here. I really, I really appreciate it.